Hello. Vous m'entendez Oui. Salut. Salut. Désolée, je n'ai pas vu le temps, pardon. C'est pas grave. <rire> je voulais juste être sûre que <rire> tu étais réveillée. Oui, 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 j'étais réveillée depuis 6h30, ça, ce n'est pas un problème. <rire> Bon, okay. c'était bon. J'ai mis Alexia comme coach, donc normalement. Euh, alors, normalement, je vais partager. Euh... Là. Yep. Tu t'es réveillé si tôt parce que c'est ton heure normale de réveil ou Oui, oui, c'est mon petit. Qui, rêve, qui se réveille tôt. Pour lui, c'est pas tôt. <rire> Pour lui, il commence la journée normale. Non, je suis une non, mauvaise langue en plus. Aujourd'hui, c'était 7h30. Pardon. C'est vrai. Oh, c'est presque que une grâce matinée, ça. <rire> c'est ça. C'est bon, vous avez bien l'image bon. euh, en plein écran, ouais. là. C'est le bon côté. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Je suis tellement pas réveillée. <rire> Mais l'enregistrement est, est, a déjà commencé en fait. Dès le début. Mais c'est pas grave, on peut couper, il n'y a pas de problème. <rire> C'est Licia qui va ne qui va pas nous, nous apprécier. <rire> et elle doit couper les choses, mais désolée, Licia, si tu vois ça. <rire> Oups. Je ferai comme la dernière fois, je reste connectée si jamais il y a des gens euh, qui. Il bon, entre Super. au milieu Ouais, ok. Cool. Enfin, c'est cool pour nous, désolé pour toi. Oui. Non, 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 t'inquiète, t'inquiète, franchement, il n'y a pas de problème. Je n'ai pas checké si euh, le premier talk était déjà en. Ah, en je ne sais pas aller voir non plus. Je pas. Non, je ne suis pas allée voir. Ça, peut-être, on va mettre les deux en même temps. Il y avait quelqu'un oui. en, en ligne tout à l'heure Il y a du sport. Oui, il y a quelqu'un qui attendait. Oui. Ah bon oui. Ah, ok. Bon, là, je vais. Il va peut-être revenir. Vous me dites quand vous voulez commencer. Je vais là. Oui. Il est 10h01. On attend encore une ou deux minutes. Je ne suis pas sûre que ça change grand-chose. Mais... Mm. 
Ah oui, Alexa, on voit ta... Euh, entre nous, on voit ta... ta souris, en fait. Ma souris Attends. Bah, ah, tu, sais quand... ouais, tu... Ouais. tu sais, hier, on se demandait si on la voyait ou pas euh, quand tu l'as bougée. D'accord. Et tu vois quand je vais dans le bandeau au-dessus, là, non Ouais, là, je vois. Ah, tu vois En fait, je vois quand tu es dans le bandeau au beige, là. Ah oui, d'accord, mais tu vois pas que c'est le bandeau... En fait, c'est moi, c'est le bandeau zoom qui s'ouvre, ça se voit pas. Toi, tu ah. vois juste l'écran normal. D'accord, ok. Bon, ça... ouais. Ok, oui, donc éventuellement, je peux faire des... Ah oui, il faut que je me mette... Des démonstrations. Ça. Ouais. T'es une hôtesse. Présentons une belle voiture. <rire> voilà, disons ça. Une belle graine. <rire> je vais... Oui, mais comme je suis sur l'autre écran, ouais, je vais essayer. On va Euh, ben, je sais ouais, pas quoi faire. On y va et on s'en fout, de toute façon, c'est enregistré. Oui. Et... De toute façon, ouais, je sais que la majorité des gens attendent plutôt le, de les coordonner. Et comme euh, oui. malheureusement, oui. euh, c'était un peu tard euh, l'annonce de cette. Oui. Euh, la mettons en part. Ok. Bon, ben, merci beaucoup et bon courage, les filles. Merci. <rire> tout à l'heure. Et tout à l'heure. <rire> Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending the second uh, bioarchaeological bio lecture on Introduction to Archaeobotany. In the continuity of the first lecture, we will present the method, research question, and example of studies in archaeobotany. However, this lecture will fo focus on uh, macrobotanical remains. Alex, yeah. yeah. The normal process, uh, once a plant dies, is that it will be decomposed and then disappear. So to allow uh, the preservation, uh, their preservation, specific conditions are required. There are four main preservation modes by, by which macrobotanical uh, remain can be recovered. The first one is charring on the on, on the right, uh, which is when the remains are exposed to fire. The second one is desiccated, um, when they are exposed to very dry or um, arid environment, such as desert. There is a mineralization when the organic matter is replaced by inorganic uh, mineral, usually when they are in contact with um, Uh, metal or even specific um, context. And finally, water logging, when the remains are uh, immerged in water without oxygen, preventing their disintegration by macrobiological macro bio, uh, micro bio activity. So the preservation mode will have an impact on the taphonomy. Some taxa or floral part Uh, being uh, better preserved than others. If uh, we take the example of flax, the seed can be preserved by all uh, modes, but the charring process usually damage more the taxa with high uh, oil content, such as flax, sesame, cotton, or poppy. And they will tend to uh, be disordered or even explore, explode during um, the charring. Water logging on the other side is the best preservation mode and plant remain usually uh, conserve their integrity and ornament pattern are uh, very often well visible. While remain of the capsule or flax, for example, uh, have been recovered uh, charred like uh, in the top uh, left bottom, um, top, 
top left um, square, uh, like here in Jordan, this part of the plant is much more uh, frequent um, in the waterlogged uh, assemblage. As you can see on the bottom right um, uh, in, in the UK, for example. In addition, uh, flax can be exploited for its uh, fiber to make textile. And this type of remain is often well-preserved, desiccated or mineralized as illustrated here uh, on the top right uh, with a flag, flax wick and copper representing a Byzantine lamp recovered in Israel. An additional preservation mode can uh, sometimes be considered as an absence of remain is the impression of plants. Among the earliest evidence of plant impression, there is the work of Hans Elbeck at Jarmo on, on, on the left. Uh, so the site is located in northern Iraq, and the impression highlighted the presence of um, emmer wheat chaff on the site. A bit later, the silicon cast uh, taken by George Wilcox uh, on the wall of PPNB, uh, PPN PPN uh, site at Jarfel Armar and uh, Murebet in uh, northern Syria reveal uh, first the presence of barley and rye, and second, their wide uh, morphology. Now let's talk about sampling. Um, conversely to microbotanical sampling, sampling for uh, macrobotanical uh, remains requires less the presence of the archaeobotanist on the site. It's always better, of course, especially to adapt the strategy, but the collect itself is not technical and do not require um, specific uh, equipment, so anyone can do it. There are three major strategies to collect sediment samples for macrobotanical remains. Um, the first one refers to total sampling, meaning that each archaeological unit discovered uh, on the site will be sampled. It doesn't matter if several of them are later grouped. Um, for example, this system was uh, applied on the Greek Bronze Age site of uh, Keros. The second option is to apply a judgmental sampling, meaning that the potential of the context will be evaluated and those having the higher probability to deliver remains will be sampled. This strategy is one of the most common, but more than the other options, it requires um, communication between the archaeobotanists, archaeologists, and uh, field workers. And the third option, called systematic, um, refers to an arbitrary sampling according to space and depth. It doesn't matter the archaeological features, samples will be um, collected at regular intervals, uh, vertically or horizontally. Knowing uh, these three options, uh, the sampling strategy will depend on um, the question behind the archaeobotany, the type of site, and the logistic. Um, indeed, for example, if you are excavating in a remote area, you may not be able to collect and process the same amount of sediment as um, if you are in a city with all facilities. And similarly, old sites like Paleolithic settlements are usually excavated in a more um, finer way, often with a grid system to record the material, and they can be more adapted to um, systematic sampling. As you can see, uh, archaeobotany requires quite a large amount of soil, and um, the, the, the collect of small tubes is generally useless, but in some cases, uh, very specific um, end picking uh, can be applied, but generally bulk sampling um, is much better even for uh, radiocarbon uh, dating. In addition to the sampling strategy, a sub-sampling system can be necessary. And again, there are three possibilities. Uh, first, the collection of bulk samples representing the random collection of sediment uh, filling archaeological units. This method is usually applied to small features like post holes. Uh, when you excavate the post hole, you empty it and keep the whole sediment. The second method is the scatter sampling. 
uh, where you're going to multiply the sample within one unit. And that's the case for large room, for example. Um, once you reach the occupational floor, uh, you want to see if there was a special distribution. So you're going to take several uh, small samples in the internal space, for example, in each corner and in the middle. And finally, the last uh, and maybe less common method would be to collect samples in a column, uh, usually the section, and the aim uh, being to provide an information according to time, but at a higher resolution um, to, to include layers that were not seen during the extensive excavation, for example. And again, you need to adapt the strategy, and uh, of course, you can uh, also combine several uh, strategies. When sampling on the site, you need to record some um, uh, very uh, essential information. First of all, information about the context, uh, the trench, the locus, the unit. Secondly, the strategy applied. For example, if you collected the sediment uh, in a specific location because you observed a higher uh, concentration of remains. And um, uh, thirdly, it's also better to mention if there is any possibilities of uh, contamination. The date and name also of the person that took the sample is good because um, it will allow you to check uh, data uh, in case of uh, problems um, later. Here you can see examples of archaeological context with a higher probability to recover plant remains. Um, these include but are not limited to any type of firing structure, such as earth, fireplace, tanu, uh, pottery kiln, um, because plant remains may be charred. But it also includes domestic areas where plant activities may occur, like internal and um, external floors, as well as architectural elements. And uh, sometimes the presence of plants, uh, whatever the preservation mode is obvious, uh, that the case uh, here on the floor full of uh, Celtic uh, seeds on the bottom left here, um, uh, uh, so that's uh, hackberry seeds, uh, preserved by mineralization. But also when a building has been destroyed by um, a fire and the collapsed structure is exposed. Remains can be of very small size, less than uh, 0.5 millimeter, and not necessarily visible by eyes. Um, and that's why it's very important to adopt the sampling strategy and avoid end picking. And finally, it's also important to know that some contexts are more favorable to the recovery of, of plant remains. Um, indeed, domestic spaces or houses where daily activities took place are more susceptible to uh, contain plants than, uh, for example, institutional places. While uh, underwater archaeology is not the most uh, common type of excavation, there are some examples. On the, the left picture, you can see uh, diving at the Neolithic site of uh, Lean or uh, Greece, or um, at the the pit of Atlit Yam in Israel coast. And in this context, and de depending on the story of the site, plant remains can be uh, preserved in different modes. They can be charred, mineralized, or waterlogged, or a mix of different types. In the case of waterlogged material, the process is slightly, slightly different. To secure their preservation, the organic residue need to stay wet. So I won't uh, detail the process here. Um, uh, you can also refer to uh, the YouTube um, uh, video uh, provided by uh, Steffi Jacome and her lab, which is in the in the bottom of the slide. Um, but just to let you know that after the collection of the on the site, the sample are uh, wash over, as you can see on the top uh, right. And then uh, they are uh, sorted under a microscope, but they remain st uh, stay in uh, distilled water, as you can see uh, on the photo. And this uh, this uh, specificity make uh, the work, uh, the sorting part, much more harder.
So the volume of the soil to collect uh, depend on the strategy apply. But for bulk sampling, the idea is that if the structure is relatively small, let's say if you have a post hole, uh, which is quite shallow, uh, and the volume of the sediment is less than uh, one liter, uh, you will just take the whole uh, content. And if it is uh, larger, then you will uh, collect uh, an average between 10 and 30 liters. So, of course, the volume of sediment to collect uh, will depend on uh, your uh, facilities, your uh, strategy, but uh, this um, gives enough soil uh, to, to recover plant remain and to make it uh, quite representative. Like on the field, the processing of sample required a recording. For each sample you're gonna process, whatever the method you apply, you will give a sample number. You're gonna report information uh, written on the tag and measure the volume of the sediment you uh, process. So you can just measure the volume uh, using a, a simple um, plastic bucket, as you can see here. It's, it doesn't need to be very accurate. In arid environment, and sometimes also in uh, remote areas, the most common method is uh, dry sieving. The sediment, which is usually sandy, is uh, poured in a column of sieve uh, with various uh, mesh, as you can see on the picture, and they are sorted accordingly. This method presents the advantage of allowing for the preservation of some fragile uh, remain, which uh, may disintegrate when they enter in contact with the water. Uh, this program, for example, has been uh, raised by Amaya Rans on the Epipaleolithic of Shubaika in Jordan, and where many charred uh, tubers uh, of Siperase were recovered. However, um, she uh, highlighted the fact that they tend to disappear once they enter in the water. So the use of dry sieving allows for the preservation in a very good state, as you can see on the, on the right picture. And um, another possibility is uh, to apply the wash over sieving. Um, which uh, here again, you can see a, a column of uh, sieve with different mesh. And this is uh, basically, uh, it can be applied for any kind of sediment, but um, uh, when the sediment is quite uh, clayish, it's, it's good to help to disintegrate uh, the sediment. So charring is the most common way of preservation for plant uh, remains. And one of the most efficient methods to recover the plant remains is the flotation, um, which can be manual or mechanical. In both cases, um, the principle is the same. The charred remains are uh, lighter than water and float, um, as you can see on the uh, bottom left uh, picture. There are various ways of uh, building a machine-assisted system. The number and the size of the tanks varies, but they all have a pump, uh, which can be electrical or manual, to uh, recycle the water. So once you measure the volume of sediment, you can pour it in the first tank, the IS that you have uh, on the left here, uh, where a one millimeter bottom mesh was settled and the floating remains uh, will come up to the surface of the water and um, uh, with the water flow, they will be catch in the 0.5 or 0.3 millimeter mesh uh, settled here between uh, tanks one and two. Uh, and this method allows to process um, efficiently a large number of samples. The manual flotation works similarly, but tanks are replaced by buckets um, and here you pour the sediment in one bucket, fill it with water, and um, steer the sediment and water that charred remains come up to the surface. Then you gently pour the water um, without the bottom sediment into a second bucket where you settle, as you can see here, uh, the 0.3 millimeter mesh. As you can imagine, this process is a bit uh, uh, longer, but uh, it works well uh, too. 
And then once nothing else is floating, we obtain the content of the one millimeter bottom mesh called heavy residue or heavy fraction and the content of the um, 0 0.3 uh, or 0 0.5 uh, millimeter mesh that you have on the right called um, light residue. The heavy fraction is let to dry uh, in the shade and um, can then be sorted by eyes. It contains all items that do not float, uh, including, for example, bones, lithic, uh, pottery shells, and uh, various objects uh, in metal or in glass, for example. But um, this fraction can also contain heavy plant remains, such as dense wood charcoal, uh, nutshell fragments, or seeds not preserved by charring. And here again, on the uh, bottom right, you have a uh, an example of um, uh, mineral, mineralized seeds of um, hackberry of Celtis. And similarly, the light fraction is also dried in the shade um, and ready to be sorted under um, a low power microscope. So now let's start with uh, one of the type of materials that you can find in those uh, sample, uh, which is wood. And the first question is, uh, it seems to be a bit silly, but what is wood? So wood is a tissue forming woody plant, such as uh, trees, shrubs, and lianas, to which the raw sap is conducted from the root to the photosynthetic organs. It also play a role to, for the support of the plant as well as for the uh, storing of nutritive uh, substance. Xylology is a study of wood in uh, various discipline. Um, is a study of wood and various discipline exist, focusing on different aspects of wood, like the dendro which concern more precisely the study of trees and their growth. But the discipline that uh, we will be interested in today is anthracology, which is the study of charcoal fragments. Indeed, uh, carbonization is the most common mode of preservation of wood charcoal at archaeological site. Charcoal are carbon skeleton resulting from the incomplete combustion, combustion of wood. Um, so this is a stage just before it is transformed into ashes. So a few words again uh, about uh, the, the wood uh, and its composition. Um, so the cambium uh, is the generative base of the wood, uh, which produces wood in the form of rings uh, that are superimposed uh, year after year. And um, it's located between the wood and the bark and uh, formed uh, toward the inside. Uh, the wood itself, uh, called also the secondary xylem, it's the condu conductive uh, tissue of the raw sap. And toward uh, the outside, uh, it forms the liber or inner bark. And this part is the uh, conductive tissue of the elaborated sap. Sapwood is the most recently uh, formed rings of wood, and it's the peripheral part of the wood in which, in which the parenchyma cells are still alive. And the earth wood that you have here in a uh, dark brown, um, it is the inner region of the wood corresponding to the oldest formed layers and uh, no longer containing uh, living cells. Three sec sections uh, of the wood will be analyzed in order to identify the species. Um, you have there here on the uh, top right, the transverse section, the tangential section, and the radial section. And they provide different information um, that will be useful to recognize the taxa. Indeed, thanks to the burning, the anatomical structure of wood is well preserved and um, allows the identification of taxa by direct observation of the three anatomical uh, planes using um, a reflecting light microscope. As we have seen in the previous lecture, one can distinguish the gymnosperms, which have naked seeds uh, not included in an ovary, and the angiosperms, which produce seeds by flowers. And they also can be distinguished by their wood. 
Um, here you have the homoxylous wood of the gymnosperms, uh, like juniper or pine, um, and it's characterized by the presence of tracheid for the conduction of sap. Whereas for the uh, heteroxylous wood, uh, the wood, for example, of pomegranate or maple tree, um, so the wood of the angiosperms, it's the vessels that are uh, conducting the sap. As you can see here, the wood anatomy has a taxonomic value. It allows the identification of species. Um, it means that each woody species has a characteristic cell structure. For example, here you see on the right an example of homoxylous wood of pine, and on the left, two um, examples of heteroxylous wood. At the top, a porous wood of grape, and at the bottom, uh, a diffuse wood of poplar uh, or willow. And as you can see, you can quite easily distinguish between the three, uh, the three taxa. So the history of anthropology uh, began, with, began with the discovery of Neolithic and Bronze Age Lake uh, village in Switzerland. Two botanists, Giovanni Passerini and Oswald Herr, uh, were the first to understand the value of studying uh, charcoal. The first anthropological studies were made at the end of the 19th century uh, on charcoal originating from prehistoric hearths. But it was the French prehistorian uh, Henri Breuil, also known as uh, Abbe Breuil, uh, who was the first uh, to investigate the taxonomic identification of charcoal. This discipline took off in the second half of the 20th century with the development of the new archaeology. In 1940, Salisbury and Jane suggested that the frequency of the archaeological taxa reflects their proportion in the past vegetation. This uh, postulate uh, is a base of anthropology because it creates a way to reconstruct paleo environment from the charcoal recovered in domestic space, uh, domestic fireplace. The studies then developed and were facilitated with the switch uh, in the observation method from the transmission to the reflection microscopy. With the reflection technique, uh, the preparation is much more quicker, leading to the identification of a higher number of charcoal fragments, allowing an improving statistical analysis. Anthropology uh, took its current importance thanks to the work of uh, Jean-Louis Vernet, exploring first the paleoecological representation of charcoal from domestic hearths, second, the evolution of vegetation of, over time, and third, the relationship between human and environment. In order to identify the taxa, the piece of charcoal are uh, merely broken by hand and observed under a microscope according to the three anatomical uh, view or section. So as I, uh, Alexia highlighted, the transverse, the radial and the uh, tangential. Atlases of reference and uh, collection of modern wood as well as thin uh, section might be used to help with the identification. Uh, local floras can also provide information about the species available in the study region. So if you're working in Turkey, for example, and you find uh, something that looks like a, a pine tree, then you're gonna go into flora and see what, which species are available. And it will help, it may help you to um, focus on one or another study, another species. So a wide range of questions can be associated to the study of wood charcoal, depending on the context they are coming from. But not all archeological deposits are adapted for the reconstruction of past plant communities. Indeed, the concentration of charcoal in a firing structure like hearth or oven result from the, the last or the few last uh, fires. It represents a selected, punctual, and limited image of um, the diversity of uh, species, species exploited for fuel. Charcoal fragments disperse in the archaeological layers 
uh, are usually more representative of the, of the use of the fuel over a longer uh, period of time and should represent the past vegetation more accurately. To be useful for the reconstruction of paleo environment, uh, charcoal assemblage should represent deposit accumulated over a long period of time. These are typical, typically scattered charcoal coming from secondary refuse. Short-term or episodic events such as fireplace deposit or bias. Secondary deposits are, are more likely to produce a high diversity of wood taxa. In order to be compared, approximately similar post-depositional degradation should have applied on the various deposits. And the sample must be primarily the result of domestic fuel and contain enough uh, piece of charcoal to apply um, statistic analysis. The charcoal fragment originating from domestic fuel result from various activities such as cooking, heating, lighting, drying, etc. They give information on the type of wood used for fuel the category of plant formation around the site and also the revolution uh, through time. So here for an example, um, the anthropological analysis on several sites from the Konya Plain in Turkey, um, in Banjuklu, in Chanasan 3 and in Chataluyuk, um, have shown a temporal trend detected in the exploitation of the different woodland um, uh, during the Holocene. As you can see on the, on the diagram on the right, during the earlier phase in blue here, um, around the uh, 11th and 10th millennium uh, BP, woodland exploitation focused on riparian and wet woodland habitats um, located around the, the habitation site with, uh, for example, a lot of uh, uh, taxa from the Salicaceae family, which is the family of um, poplar or willow. And later phases uh, from the 9th to the 7th millennia BP, uh, by contrast, uh, here you have them in, uh, in yellow, um, indicate a routine exploitation of more distant uh, vegetation zones dominated by hawk, here, Quercus, and juniper, uh, juniperus. Riparian and steppe woodland habitats uh, located around the habitation site continue to be used throughout this period as uh, indicated by the ubiquity of uh, uh, Ulmaceae, it's the elm family, um, and uh, the Salicaceae, again, the poplar and willow family, uh, um, throughout all the uh, Chataluyuk sequence. And uh, some other taxa uh, were also identified as um, from the steppe woodland as pistachio tree or tree from the uh, apple and plum family. At Chataluyuk, again, um, the anthropological analysis uh, have shown a high frequency of fungal decay here um, in wood prior to sharing in the assemblage, uh, suggesting a preference for the collection of dry dead wood and uh, or seasoned wood as fuel. The wood was either collected as dead wood and uh, or stored uh, on or of site for a period of time for seasoning prior uh, to burning. And moreover, the results of minimum diameter estimations and uh, wing width uh, measurements demonstrate the possible wood anatomical signatures of uh, management activities or controlled cutting cycles um, in both uh, semi-arid uh, woodland with oak uh, and riparian woodlands with elm uh, during the, the occupation of the site. And wood anatomical approaches can also allow to elaborate uh, hypotheses concerning the management system of woodlands. And here, for example, uh, about pollarding, uh, it can be identified in archaeological fragments um, by a detailed analysis uh, of the wood anatomy with the presence of a, a, a narrow tree wing, as you can see here on the, on the, the scheme on the right. 
Fuel can also be used in uh, specialized activities such as pottery, metalworking, funerary practices, coal production, etc. Those uh, specific use can provide information on woodland management and on human choice. Indeed, they may represent the selection of certain type of fuel for specific activities. Here uh, is an example in Sudan at uh, Meroe and the uh, nearby site of uh, Amada. The anthropological analysis indicates the selection of a single species, uh, Nile acacia, uh, also the Latin name is Acacia nilotica, in the context of metal uh, production. By comparison, the other contexts give a more diversified spectra of species, demonstrated that, demonstrating that the use of Acacia nilotica was neither a fuel shortage or the result of an environmental degradation. Instead, the selection of acacia was perfectly adapted to the iron production thanks to its, its high density and also high uh, calorific uh, value. Another common use of uh, wood is as a timber. It can, for example, provide information on the work of wood and techniques of uh, construction. The analysis of uh, charcoal remain originating from timber allow for the exploration of the various use of wood and the origin of the raw material. On the left is an illustration of the site of, uh, well, on both uh, pictures, you can see a, a illustration of the site of Ebla. But on the, on the left, uh, you can see wood charcoal study demonstrated the use of uh, ash tree, so Fraxinus, for the manufacture of a luxury piece of furniture, like here's a wooden table. And similarly, at the same site, large chunk of uh, beams and columns were made of uh, cedar wood. Um, and these were, for example, identified in the annex of the throne uh, room, as you can see on the right. So the recovery of cedar wood at Ebla also led the question on the origin of timber wood used for the construction of the palace. It may have been imported from the nearby Anti-Lebanon mountain or from a bit further like the Amanus mountain via the river. This system of transportation is documented in the inscri inscription of Gudea of Lagash, um, which is dated from the, the end of the third millennium, or uh, in the iconography, like here on, on, on the right uh, picture, uh, with an example of an Assyrian relief uh, coming from the palace of Doshawukin, also called uh, Korsala. Another aspect of the study of food charcoal is um, the study of vegetation fires approached by pedoanthracology, um, which makes possible to question the frequency of fires, for example, the paleoclimates, uh, or even various practices uh, such as, um, as you can see here on the left, the slash and burn. So the anthropology, the study of wood charcoal, allows to approach uh, two integrated minefields of interpretations. The paleoecology, with the study, for example, of uh, the evolution of the vegetation cover and the biodiversity, um, and also the paleoeconomy, the study of societal uh, practices in relation to the management of forest stand or uh, woodworking, for example and um, those two approaches are being largely uh, integrated. So now the second uh, discipline of macrobotanical remains um, that we wanted to introduce is the study of seeds and fruits, sometimes called carpology, due to its Greek uh, etymology, as you can see, carpos uh, meaning fruits. And this discipline includes the study of seeds, fruits, uh, and uh, floral parts, such as the stem, the leaves, uh, or chaff. Seeds and fruits uh, analysis developed at the beginning of the 19th century with the discovery and first study of uh, desiccated plant remains in um, an, e an Egyptian tomb. It was followed by the analysis of waterlogged remains um, uh, recovered in prehistoric lakes in Switzerland. 
And uh, after that, this field of research developed and uh, at the end of the 19th uh, and beginning of the 20th uh, century, the first synthesis on plants in the old world were published. Um, in the 1950s, research on the Near East emerged and the strong focus concerned the origin of agriculture, uh, which was previously already questioned uh, by the botanist um, Alphonse de Candolle. And thanks to researchers such as Ansel Beck and uh, uh, William Van Zeist, many archaeological sites in um, uh, Iraqi, Iran, uh, Turkey, Syria, or Jordan, um, uh, 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 many plant remains uh, were collected and uh, archaeobotanical uh, reports published. And simultaneously, archaeobotany developed also in other regions like uh, Russia, China, China and uh, in Peru. And um, since the uh, 1970s, many researchers uh, developed uh, tools and methodologies to help with the uh, identification of the plant remains uh, based on the morphology and uh, on the morphometry and uh, to help with the identification of practices with the integration of uh, statistics, uh, isotopic studies or functional ecology. Um, in 1968, uh, uh, a hub for archaeobotanists was created with the foundation of the International Work Group for Paleoethnobotany, the IWGP, and later with the journal uh, Vegetation History and Archaeobotany. So now, uh, once the light fraction is completely dried, we can analyze it and um, under a low power microscope and start uh, sorting the seeds, fruits, and all the floral parts. Since the remains can be of various size from more than uh, five millimeter, for example, for fruits like uh, olive kernels uh, to less than 0 0.5 millimeter like teff, uh, the sample can be sieved and sorted according to the mesh size. In addition, uh, if the sample is too large, too rich, it can be divided. And now the sorting phase consists in picking all the plant remains and organize them according to their um, identification, as you can see here um, uh, on, on the right. But in order to be able to first classify the remains and then identify them, it's necessary to have botanical knowledge, uh, especially about plant and fruit anatomy. Uh, indeed, in archaeobotanical samples, uh, we can find, as we have uh, already said, fragments of stem, leaves, uh, pedi pedicels, uh, rachis, grain, nutshells, etc. The differences will depend on the family, the genus, or the species. Uh, for example, here on the left, you see uh, various examples of uh, uh, inflorescences. They can be of different types. Uh, like spike, or racem, or, or umbels, for example. And uh, also some example of fruits, which can be classified in different groups. Uh, for example, uh, the berry, the capsules, the legumes, or also the caryopsis. And uh, knowing uh, the, the anatomy will help to identify the remains. But of course, the preservation mode and the taphonomy plays an important role. Um, if we compare charred and desiccated hulled barley grain, um, as you can see on the uh, uh, top right, um, the envelopes, the glooms, will be much easier to identify on the desiccated ones. The firing temperature is another factor to take into account. Um, uh, the highest it is, the more distorted or uh, puffed uh, will be the remains and the, um, the ornament will uh, disappear. And we have this as example on the uh, bottom right with the evolution of the, um, the form of the grain according to the, the temperature of cherry. So archaeobotany is the art of the observation. Um, once sorting is over and the primary categorization is done, uh, it's now time for the proper identification based on the morphology, the size, and uh, on the potential characteristic features like um, ornament patterns. Um, atlases and modern collection of reference are used for comparison as for the other disciplines. 
um, and camera with softwares uh, can be used for measurements, for example, and um, high uh, resolution system of imagery, such as the, the scanning electron microscopy can help to uh, reveal some details which uh, allow to better identify the remains. So although archaeobotany is the study of plant remain, as for the heavy fraction, the light uh, fraction may also contain non-plant remains. Of special interest is the evidence of invaders, uh, such as rodents that uh, can be represented by macrophonal uh, remain and um, pellet. Uh, we can also find insects uh, that can either be recovered in the assemblage or whose presence or impact is suggested uh, through marks uh, directly on, on the seed, like uh, a hole, for example. And finally, in the light uh, fraction, we may also recover uh, fish bone or uh, otolith, which is uh, a part of the inner here, allowing uh, ichthyologists to estimate the age of, uh, for example. So these non-plant remain can be of interest for the reconstruction of practices such as storage or to evaluate uh, yield loss, but they can also be uh, a proxy to uh, discuss or provide information about uh, climate. So the first and original interest of archaeobotany was to reconstruct uh, ancient, ancient uh, diet. For that reason, the earliest archaeobotanical studies were concentrated on crops like cereal, pulses, and fruits. Thanks to the identification, researchers were able to make a list of plants that may have been used for human consumption. That's how we were able to define the Neolithic crop package, including wheat, uh, so hammer and einkorn, barley, lentil, pea, chickpea, and flax. The development of research and the discovery of new taxa contribute to extend the list of the most ancient crops, but also shed light on the value of a wide range of uh, taxa, especially uh, the wild uh, taxa that were likely eaten too. In addition to the list of taxa, by referring to the archaeological context and comparing the archaeobotanical assemblage to other data, including tools such as grinding stone, pottery, etc., and also other disciplines um, such as archaeozoology, micromorphology, etc., we may be able to reconstruct activities and their special distribution. This is, for example, illustrated uh, with the kitchen of Djerf uh, el in northern Syria. The building delivered several equipment, including bean, uh, grinding stone, vessel, uh, puzzle, uh, herd, and many macrobotanical remains, especially lentil and barley, as well as remains of what was called galette, uh, which uh, represents uh, an equivalent of uh, our modern flatbread. Uh, which were containing uh, mustard seeds. Investigation allowed for the reconstruction of food activities, including storage, processing, and uh, cooking. Plant remains do not only tell us uh, information of, of uh, what was consumed, but it can also tell us how. By analyzing uh, which part of the plant is preserved, like on the left, uh, you can see remains of a uh, tart resin, so um, the whole grapefruit, so the berry, uh, not only the seed, who, uh, whose uh, uh, ways of um, whose surface show evidence of sugar. This reflects the, con the consumption of dried fruit, a way of uh, conservation, which is uh, very well known. In the middle, you can see a uh, barley grain with a long germ coming out of the embryo, uh, reflecting the practices of malting, which is well known to be used for the production of uh, beer, for example. Finally, archaeobotanical remains also include what is called uh, amorphous residue. And in the last decade, a lot of effort was made to uh, find a way to identify them. 
by combining uh, experimental work on food processing and the development of imagery, especially uh, uh, as you can see on, on the right picture, the scanning electron macroscopy. Um, uh, these, uh, the combination of the two uh, give a very high resolution and we are now able to reconstruct the content of these amorphous residue and define uh, a bit more accurately food waste. In the present case, so the, the right picture, um, uh, it highlights the discovery of uh, the earliest uh, bread remains that were recovered in Jordan on an uh, epipaleolithic site. Archaeobotany also investigates uh, crop processing, uh, which refers to the steps uh, leading to the consumption uh, of the plants, uh, which means the cleaning, the husking, the grinding. Um, and the idea is that from the field to the, cons the consumption, each stage, um, uh, each activity will produce desirable and undesirable products uh, called byproducts, um, depending on their uh, respective use. And for example, the cereal grains will be used for human food, uh, whereas the chaff and the straw will be given as fodder to animals and um, they can be classified according to the floral part and their size. Um, experiments have been conducted on various crops, um, including cereals, as you can see on the left, and also pulses of fruits. And here on the right, you have an example um, about uh, olive. As um, already mentioned in the first lecture, plants can be used for human and um, animal consumption. In the second option, plant remains can be recovered in the dung or animal pellets. Um, experiments have demonstrated that all plants and plant parts do not survive similarly to the digestion process. Um, and for example, several grains are more damaged than uh, chaff uh, or seeds of small size. And um, uh, numerous studies have provided criteria for the identification of plants as fodder uh, or grazed, uh, such as uh, a high rate of fragmentation, uh, the presence of uh, um, small seeds uh, less than two millimeters, the low abundance of wood charcoal, and a mix of charred and um, uncharred remains. Um, uh, for example, at the early Bronze Age site of Telelab in central uh, Anatolia, hundreds of uh, sheep and goat pellets uh, were recovered, and they especially contain a large amount of fruits of uh, polygonaceae, a chaff of barley, wild grasses, legumes, and um, some other wild taxa. And as highlighted by the archaeobotanical study, the animal diet was mainly composed by wild taxa. And uh, uh, contemporaneous textual evidence indicates that caprine flocks were mainly fed by grazing. Um, only the ones uh, that will later be slaughtered for the meat uh, would be fed with grains. As we explained earlier, so one of the main and most ancient questions associated to archaeobotany in Southwest Asia is the domestication of plants. And um, this question aimed to understand the transition from intergatherers to farmers at the um, onset of the Holocene. Most of the work was led on cereals, um, first because they are an important uh, component of our modern plant economy, and secondly, because um, uh, evidence was slightly uh, easier to identify. Apart from archaeobotany, research on the domestication uh, requires the integration of uh, environmental proxies, uh, geobotanical distribution, and genetic. Um, here in wild stands, um, as you can see on the top uh, left, when cereals reach their maturity, the spikes shatter to disperse, disperse the spikelets and secure the reproduction. Um, in 1989, Mordechai Kislev pointed out that in a wild population, um, due to a genetic mutation, some individuals do not shatter. And these domestic types, uh, as illustrated on the, the bottom uh, left, will reintegrate the population um, and their, um, their percentage will increase years after years. 
Um, in order to identify this process, archaeobotanists analyze the rachis or spikelet basis of the cereal, as you can see here in the middle. Um, smooth descent scales reflect individuals that shattered naturally, the wild ones, um, whereas the rough scars or tight specimens represent the domestic ones. And based on that, we observed an increasing uh, proportion of domestic types, as you can see here on the graph, um, uh, for emmer and encorn. And of course, the domestication process is associated to categories of crops, um, uh, including the pulses, the fruit, uh, the spices, for example. Um, but the morpholo morphological um, uh, changes are not necessarily easily perceptible uh, in archaeobotany. In parallel to genetic and morphological change visible to the rachis or spikelet, the domestication also impacted the morphology of the grain or seeds that overall uh, became bigger. In addition, agricultural practices such as sowing, uh, tilling, or plowing contributed to soil uh, disturbance that allow for the development of uh, arable wheat flora. Uh, which represent uh, plant invaders growing in cultivated uh, fields. This uh, phenomenon was highlighted uh, for uh, the beginning of the Neolithic, where we observe an increase of the weed uh, flora, uh, as you can see on the, on the graph on the bottom uh, left, in parallel with the increase of uh, domestic uh, cereal. In the last decades, archaeobotany has seen the development of new methodology to reconstruct uh, agricultural practices. Among those is the functional weed ecology, functional interpretation of botanical surveys, which take into account measurement of functional attributes and ecological characteristics from modern species and apply it to archaeological assemblage. Thanks to this method, for example, the low input of field was recently demonstrated uh, for the Neolithic, uh, early Neolithic site of uh, Djerfelama and Jade, um, compared to the later site of uh, Chataloyuk, as you can see here on the, on, the, on the right graph. Agricultural practices, especially irrigation and manuring, were developed to improve crop yield. And irrigation was developed during the third millennium in region where uh, mean annual rainfall were uh, too low to support plant growth. So where, uh, in areas where the isoyet is less than uh, 200 uh, millimeter. During the photosynthesis, plant absorb atmospheric uh, CO2 through the stomata located in their uh, leaves. This process is reflected through measurement of the ratio of stable carbon um, um, isotope. So the low value of the delta 30, C4, C13, indicating a drought uh, stress. Uh, delta C13 can then be used as a crop base proxy to compare crop growing condition. The graph presented uh, here um, on the top right, represent the values obtained on grain of wheat and uh, barley from uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, site. In both cases, uh, we see an increase of the value through time, so from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, suggesting that uh, crop were growing in a relatively better water condition. On the, on the extreme uh, right of the graph, you can see Abu Salabir, uh, which is um, located in a dry environment of southern Iraq. But you can observe that um, the value of the grain are quite uh, high, uh, suggesting the absence of uh, drought stress, and likely, which was likely compensated by water management. On the other side, manuring is a, a natural fertilizer uh, made of organic matter, which is spread in the field to enrich uh, the soil and increase the crop production. Manuring, which can be of human or an animal origin, is rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, 
And similarly, uh, as for carbon, to identify the practice of manuring, we use a stable isotope of nitrogen. And as you can see on the, the bottom uh, graph, um, on the right, um, you can see the result obtained on different crop from again, Neolithic to early Bronze Age sites located in northeastern Syria. They show a decrease of the nitrogen value through time, indicating a decrease of uh, manuring and may reflect the extensification of agriculture instead of intensification. And a recent comparison allows the author to correlate the result to the urban process since the cities were densely occupied, crop required to feed the large urban population were cultivated in large fields. To a lesser extent, the evolution of the archaeobotanical composition, sometimes combined with isotopic analysis, can be used as a proxy to evaluate environmental change. Like wood charcoal, the remains of fruit can provide information on the cultivation of fruits. Work on the earliest period indicate the gathering of white fruit, such as almond, pistachio, grape, or fig. As for other crops, like cereal and pulses, some fruit trees and shrubs were managed and or cultivated for a while and finally domesticated. Some of them were intensively exploited and became of uh, economic importance. This is, for example, the case of date pine that provided a wide range of uh, product and byproduct. Various parts of the palm tree can be used, the fruit are edible, the leaves and fiber can be used for basketry, matting, clothing, and the wood or wood uh, can be exploited for the architecture and uh, to make tools. The fruit are edible and can be consumed in different steps of maturity from green to ripe in various uh, ways, fresh, dried, in syrup, etc. And they can be used for human consumption, but the waste uh, byproduct can be can also be given to animals. Although earliest evidence of date stone come from southern Iraq, from the late Neolithic site of Eridu. Uh, in order to trace the domestication of date palm, archaeobotanists applied uh, geometric morphometry on date pits and uh, compared modern and archaeological material from uh, Emirate and Egyptian sites, as you can see on the bottom uh, left graph. The study revealed the presence of ancient varieties on Egyptian sites and suggests the existence of one or uh, several domestication centers. Similarly, uh, geometric morpho morphometry was applied on other uh, fruit like olive stone, as you can see on, on the right. And the outline measurement of kernel recovered on the fifth millennium site of Ishle Carmel and their comparison with modern species specimen indicate the large variability of the morphotypes, uh, even within a single uh, tree, and reveal the presence of uh, the earliest uh, domestic uh, syndrome. Exactly like for objects such as lithic pottery or jewelry, uh, another aim of archaeobotanical research is to identify trading network through the diffusion and introduction of taxa. For this, we take into account environmental data to determine if the crops can be cultivated in the region, but we also compare this with finds in adjacent areas to map geographically and chronologically the appearance and adoption of crops. This is, for example, the case of the Brocom, Brocom uh, which is also called uh, common millet, uh, that was domesticated in northern China during the beginning of the sixth millennium. The diffusion likely started during the fourth millennium as millet is attested at high altitude uh, in the Tibetan uh, plateau. New, new radiocarbon dating on the grain loaf to clarify its diffusion towards Southwest Asia. Indeed, the earliest uh, archaeobotanical evidence of millet in the Caucasus are dated to the third millennium and from there, the crop uh, spread toward Mesopotamia. 
Nonetheless, the diffusion route is still uncertain. Similarly, archaeobotanical evidence uh, always pointed uh, out the Indus Valley as the original center of origin for uh, Sesam. Indeed, uh, Sesam was found on several Arapan uh, sites dated to the mid third millennium. But it were also recovered at Abu Salabih in south uh, of Iraq. And the recent radiocarbon dating of the site suggests the occupation. Uh, slightly earlier, leading to question about its diffusion. But other evidence demonstrates that it spread toward Egypt and Levant by the second millennium and reached uh, Europe like Greece or Italy by the first millennium. Finally, as uh, previously mentioned, stable isotope applied on plant remains can be helpful to answer specific questions. And the uh, stable, uh, isotope of strontium can be used to determine the provenance of plants. At the first millennium uh, uh, of the common era site of Mleha, uh, cotton seal seeds and textiles were recovered, but their origin, local or imported, was unclear. The values uh, that you can see on the graph were different from those uh, uh, representing the local range, meaning uh, the modern vegetation, indicating that uh, first, indicating that first the cotton of Mleha was not growing uh, locally, and then by comparison uh, with value from adjacent area, so the graph, um, so the comparison uh, indicates similarly similarity with Indian uh, values suggesting uh, their source in uh, Northwest India. Archaeobotany can um, also reflect craft activities and especially the transformation of plant fibers to produce um, textile for uh, uh, clothing, sacks or sails. And um, in some uh, exceptional situations, textile can be observed, uh, can be preserved. Uh, and the best examples um, originating uh, from dry environments, uh, allowing for the desiccation uh, of the remain and their uh, better preservation. Um, and it's, for example, the case uh, illustrated here on the pictures. Uh, the left picture uh, presents uh, the well-preserved remains of textile uh, recovered at uh, Madain Saleh in Saudi Arabia and, de and dated to the first to uh, third century. Um, the analyze of textile is a specific uh, discipline but can be correlated to archaeobotanical evidence. Um, uh, indeed, like uh, equipments and tools, the discovery of plants uh, producing fibers may constitute indirect evidence for the production of textile. Um, indeed, uh, at uh, Madain Saleh, seeds, uh, whole seeds and fragments and uh, capsules of cotton of um, uh, Gossypium herbarium were identified in the archaeobotanical assemblage. However, plant remains were a piece uh, of the puzzle since the full um, uh, understanding of textile production at this site was um, allowed by the interdisciplinary study uh, combining um, archaeobotanical and textile remains, uh, landscape data, uh, as well as um, written and uh, iconographical sources. And on the right here, you have another uh, example. You can see a, a piece of uh, woven textile made with linen uh, and dated to the um, uh, mid third uh, millennium BC uh, and uh, recovered from um, uh, Saqqara uh, in uh, Egypt. Plants um, enter in various uh, rituals as offering or for the uh, preservation purposes like uh, embalming. And the archaeobotanical analysis uh, then allowed to reconstruct these uh, funerary practices. Here um, on, on the left, you have the example of the tomb uh, uh, KV uh, 63 from uh, Luxor, from the King Valley, dated to the 16th, uh, 13th century BC. And the coffin and its whole organic contents were desiccated and, as you can see, um, uh, wonderfully preserved. 
of particular interest were the floral colors um, composed by a total of 10 species, including, uh, for example, uh, leaves of uh, pomegranate, olive, willow, um, dead palm, and uh, papyrus. And the whole um, assemblage being uh, binded by a, a, a linen string. As we already mentioned in the first lecture and uh, illustrated by the example of Shanida, uh, plants can be directly used as offering. And um, in most cases, this interpretation is quite difficult to demonstrate, um, especially for charred remains because the deposition of the material can be uncertain. Um, uh, the sediment used to fill the burial uh, can uh, merely come from um, uh, domestic spaces. But the uh, Egyptian cemeteries provide good examples, as here on the right, with the case of um, uh, Der El Balas, uh, uh, dated to the uh, 16th, 15th century BC. And here, the desiccated plant remains were recovered in uh, ceramic bowls and jars uh, placed in, placed in um, uh, non elite burials in a worker's village. And the archaeological context of the, the botanical remains clearly reflects their status as offering goods. Um, and the analysis indicates the presence of certain species uh, dominated by grape, uh, date palm, or again, uh, juniper. The use of plants in uh, embalming ritual can also be identified through archaeobotany. Here is the example of the coffin of a count buried in a church in northwestern France during the 18th century of the Common Era. The archaeobotanical uh, results of the desiccated remains indicate the use of a wide range of taxa, um, including uh, juniper, rosemary, uh, oregano, uh, fennel, and uh, cloves. And these were likely used for their strong and nice uh, fragrance, but also as um, insect uh, repellents, uh, especially against necrophages. However, many plant uh, extracts, exudates, and resins uh, mentioned in the written sources couldn't be identified uh, based on the, uh, the macrobotanical remains. And instead, uh, biochemistry, uh, for example, would be more uh, helpful. So one of the best practice is to pair macro and micro botanical studies. And uh, as we have seen in the first lecture on, and, on pollen and um, phytoliths, the research questions can be similar or strongly correlated to those applied in macro botanical studies. Um, by combining the two, we multiply the chance uh, um, to obtain data, uh, for example, uh, in case of uh, taphonomical biases, and we can also complete information with um, uh, additional data provided by one or the other discipline. And practically, one of the easiest way uh, is to divide the samples, to put a small portion, um, uh, around 200 grams, for example, of the sediments collected for the macrobotanical study um, aside for the microbotanical analysis. As a last good example, Hoalo 2 is a upper paleolithic site located on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, as you can see on the picture. And the site is incredibly well preserved due to the rise of the lake level after the abandonment that uh, sealed everything. For that reason, it has been intensively investigated, especially for archaeobotany. The settlement is characterized by a six brush hut and was interpreted as a hunter-gatherer-fisher camp. The good preservation and the detailed sampling of uh, macrobotanical remains allow uh, to reconstruct the technique of construction of the hut. The wood analysis indicate that the wall of the roof were made with thick branch of tamarisk and willow and thinner branch of uh, oak. This structure was then covered by thinner branches, grasses, and leaves. Charcoal collected in hearth and damp reflect fuel and include oak, tamarisk, oriental pistachio, almond, and equisetum. 
Daily activities in the camp are represented by many wooden objects for which the function was not uh, always determined, were uh, recovered on the site. Among those, for example, a plank made uh, with the bark of either willow or poplar, as you can see on the picture, with leaves of uh, reed, either Phragmites or Tifa, uh, on, on it was uh, recovered in the middle of one of the, of the hut. Three burned twisted fibers fragments were recovered on the floor, reflecting the remains of a cord or rope or net or bag made with a monocotyledon, either uh, Tifa, Juncus, Cyperus, uh, Sirpus, Sparganium, or even maybe uh, uh, Phoenix uh, dactylifera, so date fiber. Similarly, the study of seed and fruit allow for the reconstruction of plant use and conception. Um, so the researcher maps the density of all plant remains and also of individual taxa to evaluate the, uh, where plant processing activities were taking place. In uh, red, there are, uh, you can see the highest value, whereas in green are the lowest. All the plant remains recovered at Oalo 2 are of wild type, meaning they were gathered in the surrounding of the camp. The taxa include many wild grasses, mallow, small legumes like uh, melilotus and bramble like rubus. The high concentration of plants that can be used as food or for medical purpose around the grinding stone, uh, in, you can see represented in black on, on the top of the map. Uh, suggests that this area was used for plant processing or storage. Some taxa, like Atriplex and Shreda, were widespread on the floor and may derive from uh, the roofing material. The presence of flowers of Senecio glaucus, yet that you can see um, uh, in, 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 in the middle, uh, at the entrance of the, of the hut indicate that the camp was occupied during the spring season. Finally, the analysis of the edible annual taxa indicate the exploitation of wild oat, wild barley, wild emmer, and many wild grasses such as agilops, bromus, and a few pulses like lentil or pea. The presence of numerous uh, proto-weed, which are the undesirable plant growing in um, cultivated field, led researchers to suggest a small scale cultivation. So the example of Hualo II allow a very detailed investigation of the daily life of a paleolithic camp, but we should keep in mind that this is a very unique case with an exceptional preservation. And of course, for the same uh, site, uh, the researcher applied pollen and phytolith analysis, highlighting um, uh, or giving a high resolution of the late glacial maximum climate and vegetation uh, change, and also uh, give information about uh, the processing of the wild uh, cereal. So to conclude, um, macrobotanical remains as microbotanical remains allow for the reconstruction of the environment and uh, human practices. But um, it's important to keep in mind that according to the problematic of the study, it's necessary to apply the appropriate uh, sampling strategy. Um, this also means that a high number of samples from a wide range of contexts is better than a single uh, sample from a storage structure. And in addition, the preservation state uh, should be evaluated to estimate um, the possible biases within the assemblages. And finally, uh, also it's tempting to compare the results with a modern example the interpretation um, should be based on the archaeobotanical evidence. And sometimes uh, we, we should, we have to admit that we are limited and uh, we cannot go further. And for that reason, uh, it's highly recommended to apply uh, interdisciplinarity either with the archaeobotanical uh, disciplines um, or with other fields of research like um, archaeozoology, micromorphology, or even, uh, for example, uh, textual evidence. 
And so we thank you uh, very much for your attention on this uh, second uh, lecture. And uh, please, uh, if you have any question, uh, do ask them. Thank you. Merci les filles. Ah. Là, merci, merci à toi d'avoir <rire> attendu à voir. Voilà. Et du coup, et, du coup euh, j'ai les deux liens. Euh, Delicia, je, je le partage avec vous. On le met sur, en ligne. Ok, ça marche. Okay. Super. Très bien. Allez, bon week-end. Merci. Bon week-end à toi aussi. Bye bye. Salut. Salut.